Good afternoon. So we're going to now begin our next section in the reactions and aqueous solutions where we will talk about measuring concentrations and then get into lab techniques that will measure your concentrations. Okay, so in this next video, we are going to focus on a few more learning objectives. The first few we already have talked about in our previous uh, lecture. So we're going to focus on learning objectives 2.9, 3.3, and 3.4, in which it says that the student is able to create and interpret representations that link the concept of molarity with the particle view of solutions. Students will be able to use stoichiometric calculations to predict the results of performing a reaction in the laboratory and or to analyze deviations from the expected results. And finally, the student is able to relate quantities, measured mass of substances, volumes of solutions, or volumes and pressures of gases to identify stoichiometric relationships for a reaction, including situations involving limiting reactants and situations in which the reaction has not gone to completion. So please remember that a solution is just another name for a homogeneous mixture. And with any mixture, they can have variable composition. So we can have two solutions that contain the exact same compounds, but can be very different because of the proportions of the compounds are different. When we look at measuring concentrations, you guys will hopefully recall from last year that we talked about molarities, molalities, percent by volume, percent by mass, mole fractions. The one nice thing with AP Chemistry is the only one that we have to really focus on will be molarity. So when we talk about the molarity of a solution, we're talking about the number of moles of solute per unit of volume for the solution. So by definition, we say number of moles of solute per liter of solution. So when we want to create a solution with a specific molarity, we need to weigh out the mass of the solute using a electronic balance. And then we want to use what is known as a volumetric flask. We're gonna add the solute in to the flask and then we will add water until it reaches the line for the flask. For the volumetric flask, you can't really see it on the picture here, but there literally is just one line that we have for that entire flask. And that one line is measured very, very accurately. So whereas a lot of your beakers or Erlenmeyer flasks, they can have up to a 5% error in them. So if I had a 500 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask, I could be off by as much as 25 milliliters when I fill it up to a certain line. So it's not very accurate. When we're talking about a volumetric flask, typically we're talking about it being within about a 0.1% range for the error. So if we are looking at a 500 milliliter volumetric flask, we're talking about it literally having an accuracy of 499.5 to 500.5 milliliters. So very small variation when we would fill it to that line. Oftentimes in lab, we need to make a standard solution, which is a solution whose concentration is accurately known. In order to do this, we need to use an electronic balance to get an exact mass and a volumetric flask, which will tell us an exact volume of the solution. If you recall from our previous slide, the volumetric flask has only one marking, which we call a calibration mark, and it is located right here, as you can see. And that is a extremely accurate measurement, typically within less than 0.5% error. So in order to make the standard solution, we would need to weigh out a specific amount of your solute and put it into the volumetric flask. Then we would add a small quantity of water and you would then swirl the flask and make the solid dissolve. And then once you have the solid dissolve, you would add water until you reach the calibration mark on your volumetric flask. So let's now begin to look at a few examples for calculating the molarities of a solution. So in this first example, we have a 500 gram sample of potassium phosphate dissolved in enough water to make exactly 1.5 liters of solution. 
The key thing here, if you remember from last year with molarities, you're adding to have exactly a set amount of solution. Whereas when you're talking about molality, you just add a certain mass of the solvent to the mass of the solute. So in this particular case for potassium phosphate, it would have a formula of K3PO4. And so we need to determine our number of moles. So I would start off by dissolving or taking the 500 grams of the potassium phosphate and converting it into moles. So one mole of K3PO4 is equal to 212.27 grams. And so if we divide the 500 by the 212, we end up with 2.355 moles of the K3PO4. And now from there to solve for the molarity, we would take the 2.355 and we would divide that by the 1.50 liters. And we would have a final molarity of 1.57 molar K3PO4. Three significant figures because of the 1.50 liters. Now, whenever we have a problem where it's asking you to solve for the concentration of an ion, you have to remember that all these ionic compounds will dissociate in solution. So we had to take into account the dissociation equations for each of our ionic compounds when we were determining the ions. Once you have that, you can just use your balanced equation for the dissociation process and just simply uh, multiply your molarity by the coefficients for each of your ions. So in this first example for the cobalt 2 nitrate, I would take the CONO3 parentheses 2 and we're going to do that as a solid and we know that when that is dissolved in water it would produce CO2 plus aqueous and 2 NO3 minus aqueous. So in this particular instance since I have a 1 to 1 to 2 ratio when I start with 0 0.50 molar I know that my cobalt 2 plus concentration would also be 0 0.50 molar and my nitrate concentration will be two times 0.50 molar or 1.0 molar. So I have 0.5 molar and 1.0 molar for those concentrations. When I look at the second example, I now have FeClO4 parentheses three as a solid. When that is placed into water, that will form Fe3 plus and three ClO4 minus ions, each of which are aqueous. And so when I look at this initial concentration of 1.00 molar, again, I have a one to one ratio for the Fe3 plus to the FeClO4 three. And I have three for my coefficient of the perchlorate ion compared to one for the iron three perchlorate. So I would have 3.0 molar for the ClO4 minus ion. Okay, so in our next example problem, we're going to calculate the number of moles of Cl minus ions in 1.75 liters of a 1.0 times 10 to the negative third molar zinc chloride solution. So remember, we have molarity equals moles per liter. So I can multiply both sides by the liters to get me into the moles. So I'm going to start with that and I'd have 1.75 liters multiplied by 1.0 times 10 to the negative third molar. And I'm going to rewrite that as moles per liter for the molarity. That way our liters would cancel, giving me moles. So for the solution, I would have 1.75 times 10 to the minus third moles of ZnCl2. However, once again, because it's asking for moles of chloride ions, I need to take that dissociation equation and split this into the two plus and Cl 
1 minus ions. So now, since I have the zinc chloride there with 1.75 times 10 to the minus third moles, we're going to do this out with dimensional analysis. We could then say for every one mole of the zinc chloride, we would have two moles of the Cl minus ions. So we'd end up with 3.50 times 10 to the negative third moles of Cl minus. Now we're going to do a quick concept check. Take a moment and pause the video and try to answer the question, which of the following solutions contains the greatest number of ions? Now, as we start off this problem, I want you to think about a couple of things. Number one, we're looking for the greatest number of ions. I have equal molar solutions of these substances here, so we can't just simply look at which volume is the most, because again, we have different number of ions present for each compound. So we want to make the equations that will dissociate each of the compounds as they dissolve in water. So when I look at NaCl, that would break down into Na plus and Cl minus ions. So therefore I have two ions present. CaCl2 would break down into Ca2 plus and two Cl minus ions. So I would now have three ions present. FeCl3, that would break down into Fe3 plus and 3Cl minus, and that has a total of four ions. And then finally, sucrose, that one has no ions. So for that one, it will dissolve, but because it's a sugar and a covalent compound, it will not break down into any ions. So as you are looking at this, now we have to take into account finding the greatest number of moles to find the greatest number of ions. I again have the molarities that I can multiply by the volumes. So if I take 400 for my milliliters, multiply by 0 0.10 molar, that is going to equal 40 millimoles. When I look at 300 milliliters times 0 0.10 molar, that's going to equal 30 millimoles. 200 times 0.1, that's going to equal 20 millimoles. And finally, again, because this has no ions, I don't even have to worry about it. So at this point, I have 40 millimoles of the NaCl but I have two ions. So I'm gonna multiply that times two ions, so that would give me a total of 80 millimoles. When I look at the next one, 30 millimoles of the CaCl2, that is gonna be multiplied now by three ions for a total of 90 millimoles. And then finally, we have 20 millimoles of the FeCl3, we multiply that times four ions, and that would also equal 80 millimoles. So the greatest number of ions, because I would multiply each of those by 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, would be the CaCl2. So your correct answer should be B. Now we're going to look at diluting solutions. You are able to dilute a solution by taking a stock solution, which is a solution of known concentration, and then taking a specific volume out of that sample using a pipette, in this case more of a glass pipette where kind of like the volumetric flask, it has a specific marking on the bulb to draw a specific volume into the pipette. You would then take that volume and transfer it over into an empty volumetric flask. And then as before, we would then add the solvent, the water in most cases, into that volumetric flask until we would have the line come up to that calibration mark on your new volumetric flask.
The molarity of the new solution can be determined by using the equation M1V1 equals M2V2, where M1 and M2 are the molarities of the concentrated and dilute solutions, respectively, and V1 and V2 are the volumes of the two solutions. So if you look at the picture down here in A, you can see that we're drawing 25 milliliters into this pipette. So I now have a known quantity of that one molar stock solution. Again, with that stock solution, it's a known molarity. So by taking the 25 milliliters of that substance, most likely copper sulfate because it's blue, and multiplying that by the 1.00 molar, I now know that I have 25.0 millimoles of the solution. In the second picture, all I'm doing to this is now adding extra solvent once I've dispensed the 25 milliliters into the new volumetric flask. So then with the last picture here, I'm now going to add extra solvent until I reach that new volume. But again, the number of moles stays the same from picture B to picture C. These two here have the same number of moles. So now all I have to do is take my number of moles and divide by the new total volume of the solution. It just makes it easier because the product of M1 and V1 would be equal to the number of moles. And then the product of M2 and V2 is also equal to the number of moles. But again, since the same number of moles here, moles one would equal moles two. So it just kind of eliminates having to do the equation twice and we can just plug it into this formula. Okay, so let's do one more concept check. For this one, we have a 0.5 molar solution of sodium chloride in an open beaker sits on a lab bench. Which of the following would decrease the concentration of the salt in the solution? So again, we're trying to make the concentration lower. So in A, by adding water to the solution, again, my number of moles of the salt, and that's what we want to really think about, what's going to affect the moles of the salt and cause it to go down. So when I look at this one, by adding more water to the solution, I have a larger volume, but I would have the same number of moles. So adding water would cause a decrease. When I look at my second example, pour some of the solution down the sink drain. Yes, that would decrease the number of moles, but because this is a homogeneous mixture and they spread throughout, by dra uh, draining some of the solution, you will decrease the number of moles, but you would also decrease the amount of volume of solution proportionately. And so you'd still have the same molarity after you pour some down the sink as you did to begin with. So B would not be correct. If I add more sodium chloride to the solution, now I'm going to increase the number of moles while I keep the volume of the solution relatively the same. It might go up slightly, but it would not be proportional to that. So as a result, C would increase the concentration, not decrease the concentration. For D, if I let the solution sit out in the open air for a couple of days, in a case like that, we would have water evaporating from the container because it's open to the air. And as a result of that, we would lose some of the volume of the solution. The number of moles of the salt would stay the same, but by decreasing the volume through evaporation, we would actually increase the concentration instead of decrease. So D would not work either. And then it says at least two of the above would decrease. That is not true. So my only answer that would be correct would be A. Okay, so now we'll go through a practice problem to determine the new uh, volume for a solution to be made that is 150 milliliters of a 0.8 molar NaOH solution. So in this case, we are starting with a molarity of 2.00, and I want to make a total of 150 milliliters of 0.8 molar. So this would actually be my M2 and my V2 this would be my M1, and I need to solve for V1. So I can do 2.00 molar multiplied times V1 equals 0.800 molar times 
150. Now, in these types of situations, when you're doing a normal molarity problem, you have to have your volume in liters. But in this particular instance, because we're dealing with a molarity by dilution, we don't have to convert it back into liters to do our answer. So in this particular case, I can do 0.8 times 150. So that would equal for us 120, and that's the molarity times the milliliters, and that would be equal to two molar times V. So if I divide both sides by two, then I would have my molarities cancel, and I'm left with a volume equal to 60 milliliters. So here's where we can now start putting everything together. When we start looking at solution stoichiometry problems, we can use our information about reaction prediction to determine what substances will be found in the reaction vessel after the reaction occurs whether or not we're going to have a precipitate or a gas that would form or water that would form as part of the reaction. We can write the balanced net ionic equation for the reaction. We can then calculate the number of moles of each reactant, determine the limiting reactant, and also calculate the number of moles of the product or grams. And also we can find the excess reactant that is left over. So a lot of times what you'll find is these problems will ask you to determine an excess reactants number of ions that would still be found in solution. So we'll go through a couple of example problems where you can see this. Okay, so part one of our first question says we have 10 milliliters of a 0.3 molar sodium phosphate solution reacts with 20 milliliters of a 0.2 molar lead to nitrate solution, assuming no volume change. So when we look at this reaction here, first we want to identify what precipitate will form. So again, thinking along those lines, when I have this double replacement reaction, I have AB plus CD forms AD plus CB. So sodium uh, phosphate, excuse me, would be Na3PO4 and lead to nitrate, PBNO3 parentheses 2. Again, both of these would be aqueous because there are two reactants. Sodium is an alkali metal. Nitrate is a always soluble compound as well. So I have two aqueous solutions there. I have the NaNO3, that would be my A forming with my D. And then I have Pb3PO4 parentheses two. And so that there, because our phosphates are insoluble unless they are bonded to an alkali metal or ammonium compound, this will be my solid. So PB3PO42 would be my precipitate. And now if we look at part two, it says what mass of the precipitate will form. So getting back into this, I'm gonna set up my rice table quickly. So I have the Na3PO4 plus the PBNO3 parentheses two forming NaNO3 and the Pb3PO4 parentheses 2. So as I start off this process here, again I have the 10 milliliters of 0.3 molar, so I'm going to use my millimoles and now say that I would have 3 millimoles of the Na3PO4. We need to balance this equation, so I'd have 2, 3, 6, and 1. So there's my R. For my lead to nitrate, I have 20 milliliters of 0.2 molar, so that would be four millimoles. And when I do my C, I would have minus two X. Here I'd have minus three X. So getting this amount here, I would now have my X equaling 1.5 millimoles. And for my second one, I'd have my X equaling 1.33 millimoles. So this is my limiting reactant. So when I come over here, I could take the 1.33 millimoles and I can multiply that times the molar mass of the lead to 
which is 811.54 grams per mole. So when I multiply those out, I would get 1,079 milligrams. So divide that by 1,000 to give me into grams, and I'd have 1.08 grams of the precipitate that would form. So for part two, we're going to try to find the number of nitrate ions that are left in the solution. So for this one, we want to focus on the concentration and the volume of the lead to nitrate to begin with. So I'm going to determine my number of millimoles. So I had 20.0 milliliters multiplied by 0 0.20 molar PB and O3 parentheses 2. I want you to notice here though that my ratio of ions for every one lead, I have two nitrate ions. So I'm going to determine my number of millimoles first, 4.0 millimoles for the lead to nitrate. But now I'm going to multiply that by 2 for that dissociation equation because the PB and O3 parentheses 2 would split up into Pb2 plus and 2 NO3 minus. So I have twice as many nitrate ions. So that would give me a total of 8 millimoles. Now, we're not done in this particular sense because we have, even though it says we assume no volume change, that means that when we mix those two things together, that even though the solid forms, the volume still stays around 30. So I have my volume being the 10 milliliters plus the 20 milliliters for a total of 30 milliliters. So I now take my 8 millimoles and I'm going to divide that by the 30 milliliters. And when we put those numbers in, we should get, I believe, 0.26 repeating. Yep. So we'd have 0.267 molar NO3 minus for the ions. Okay, so now in part three, we're going to determine the concentration of the phosphate ions that are left in solution after the reaction has been completed. So this one is gonna be a little bit more complicated. So now we're looking at the excess ions. So the thing that you have to remember is that a large proportion of those phosphate ions are actually going to be found in the solid that precipitated. So what we wanna do is figure out after the precipitation occurred, how much of the phosphate was left. So I'm gonna go back and rewrite our equation here. So I had two Na3PO4, I had three PBNO3 parentheses two, I had six for the NaNO3, and then we had the PB3PO4 parentheses two, that was our solid. So we started off with 3.0 millimoles, and we had 4.0 millimoles. We subtracted 2x here for our C and we subtracted 3x over here. So if you remember that told us that our x was equal to 1.33 for our number of moles that were uh, the PBNO3 2. So I can now take this x value and plug it into this equation and that'll tell me how much is left over of the Na3PO4. So taking three minus two times 1.33, that would be 2.66. So essentially I'm gonna have 0.333 repeating for my number of millimoles of the sodium phosphate. Now notice with the sodium phosphate, I have a one-to-one -one ratio. So when this breaks up, I'd have three sodiums and I would have one phosphate ion. So if I have 0.33 millimoles, I would have 0.33 millimoles here. So now, same type of thing, I can take the 0.33 millimoles of the PO4 three minus ion. My new volume for the solution is again, 30 milliliters. So if I take 0.33, 
and I divide it by 30, that will give me a new molarity of 0 0.011 molar PO4 three minus. This will conclude the second lecture video on reactions and aqueous solutions.